software developers, freelancers. Okay. Awesome. Okay. Well, uh, I didn't have a great icebreaker. My icebreaker was Chuck Norris jokes this morning, but they say Chuck Norris doesn't do icebreakers, he does face breakers. So I have a few jokes I'm going to send to you guys for those developers in the room. Uh, thought, kind of, thought it was kind of funny. Uh, it says, Chuck Norris's beer can type 140 words per minute. It's kind of cool. Uh, Chuck Norris' keyboard doesn't have a control key because nothing controls Chuck Norris. When Chuck Norris is web surfing websites, websites get the message, warning, Internet Explorer has deemed this user to be malicious or dangerous. Proceed? Question mark. Kind of funny stuff. The last one is, Chuck Norris can delete the recycling bin. <laughs> You like that one. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Sure. That's hilarious, hilarious. That's hilarious. I had a, a contractor of mine who loved Chuck Norris's jokes, and he would every morning come in with a fresh one. I mean, I swear, it just felt hysterical. <clears throat> well, we'll get started. Uh, my name is Fred Fulcher. I am a co-owner of Mark Cole Design Group. We are a software development consulting firm um, based out of Irving, Texas. Uh, been around for nine years. It started in 2007, and um, <clears throat> kind of started in a weird way, um, I was moonlighting and freelancing on the side. And actually, this building right here, I had my last full-time role as a software development manager. And we walked in one morning, and half the company was laid off, including my team and almost half the team in that room. And so that kind of launched me out into my, my business today. I had started on the side, but uh, you know, kind of moonlighting, playing with it, you know, not taking that full leap in. And when I did that, uh, the client that we had Actually, actually was asking me to come on and do more work with them. Uh, which was great about that was I got to take four or five guys with me and keep them employed. So that was a pretty awesome start for our company. Um, what's great today, they're still our clients. We've used them three or four times, done a year or two long projects with them. And so that was an awesome start for our company history. Uh, one of the things that we, like I say, claim to fame, uh, one of our clients is Fitel. Uh, they're a company, healthcare company, technology company over here in Irving, Dallas area. And they recently got acquired by IBM Watson um, Health uh, for some untold millions of dollars. But we were part of the team that was responsible for building their web framework um, that their products stand on today. So that's our claim to fame, if you will, um, amongst other lots of failed, failed startups. <laughs> um, for, you, for guys who are late, uh, I've asked a few people who are developers in the room. Are there any other developers in the room? Okay, for any free, is everyone here freelancing, startup businesses? Who's a full-time employee, anybody? Okay, awesome, so all entrepreneurs. Awesome, okay. Well, today I'm gonna to give you a few tips and some advice that I've, I've have, uh, mistakes that I've made as well, and some advice over my nine years uh, of running companies, projects, and running my company now. Uh, I thought it was always good to start with mistakes, just because, you know, sometimes you get up here and say, oh, how great I am, that's not the case at all. And as developers, we learn a lot. You know, we create a bug, gotta fix it. Create a bug, gotta fix it. And that helps us understand what to do and what not to do. Uh, how many of you guys in here for the men are married? Okay, all right. How many guys are married past one year? year five years? And I, I see even guys, I'm going a certain direction. But girls too, five, year, five years, okay. 10, more than 10? Got one, 20? Okay, I've been married for 14 years, if you can believe it or not. And my wife is right here, she's gonna attest to this. One of the biggest mistakes I made was not listening to my wife. <laughs> you know, I, I thought, Mr. Big and Bad, you know, I'm gonna be, I know my tech, you know, you don't worry about this, I got this. And uh, she had a lot of great experience in uh, Fortune 500 companies working for Dale and Charles Schwab back in the heyday. And I thought, don't worry about it, I got it, you know? And that was the biggest mistake I made was not listening to her. And she wasn't trying to tell me about my tech as much as she was trying to show me I needed to spend time working on my business. And so that was one of the things, the first mistakes for me that I made. Uh, I would say the second mistake, one of the second mistakes that I made um, 
was not really having any systems. You know, like I said, I got launched into my business. I was, I was not, not having systems. Yeah, not having systems. Because I was launched into my business. I didn't plan the business. It wasn't something that I had expected to, you know, plan for six months, put together a business model and plan. I didn't do that. I just was launched out there, just started it. And looking back at it now, I didn't have a system for payroll. I didn't have a system for keeping time. I didn't have a system for marketing or getting new clientele. None of that. You know, I was just out there and working a project, basically 40, 60, 80 hours a week and being consumed with that project. And so as I look back at it now, if I had systems in place, the stress level would definitely be down. <laughs> I would have a few, few less gray hairs in my head. Uh, and I definitely would have been farther where I am than I am today. And so that's one of the, the second mistakes I, I think I made for, I know I made for my business. Uh, the other would be uh, not treating the business as a business. Um, you know, it's freelancing, and when you do the work that you're servicing or offering as a service, you can get pulled into, you know, the minutia of the day-to-day -day of running a project, you know, managing, you know, contractors or vendors, and sometimes you don't make time for the business. And so uh, those mistakes cost me early on. And so when that big project, you know, new, my new client came on, big project ended, I was left saying, where's the next role going to come from, the next project going to come from? I didn't spend the time that I needed to to build the business up. So those are some three major mistakes that I've made uh, over the course of you know, my career and even running our business. Um, the, the advice, some of the advice that I want to walk through today uh, is you know, maybe a little bit offensive at first for the first, first point I want to make, but it's something that I've learned um, over the years, and I'm sure you all have the same, the same way, uh, and that is don't be a jackass. You're going to build a client foundation, don't be a jackass. Don't be the person who cannot get along with people. And it's funny, I have a funny story. I, I, um, I worked in college as a full-time HR coordinator. So I was the person who everyone came to that would uh, complain about their coworkers or their boss or whoever. And I was 21 years old in this, this, this role. And we hired a uh, IT uh, tech support guy, young guy like myself. Uh, he was very sharp, very sharp guy. He walks in and he starts, you know, getting used to people, but he starts pissing people off left and right. I mean, they would come in to office and move out the way. Let me, I got this, watch out. And we'd sit down on the keyboard and just start typing away. Wouldn't talk to them, wouldn't make any eye contact, wouldn't say anything to them. And just, you know, after a while, people would come complaining and complaining and complaining. And I remember, uh, for me personally, one of the things that a lot of the developers that I've mentored over the years and my, some of my clients admire was having a, really even keel and not being moved and not getting stressed just because someone's yelling at you. Um, it's funny because you know, I, I, the, there's a quote in the Bible that says, a soft answer turns away raft. And when people are getting louder, I just get softer and softer. And you'd amaz be amazed how they come down. And being able to handle people who are just stressing you out. I mean, my, my first client I was telling you guys about, the uh, IT director, um, didn't, wasn't really fond of us and our company. Obviously, his owner brought us in and we kind of were consultants to him now, these new guys coming in. And he just gave us hell. I mean, I would wake up to emails in my, in my inbox. This is not working. This is crap. You know, all these complaints when it was really on his side because he didn't understand what was going on. And I could have re responded to him, fired off to him, and gone to the owner. Hey, you know, your guy's not helping us out here. But didn't do any of that. I just worked with him. And that allowed me to actually be called back multiple times because the owner knows I can work with this IT director. No matter how much of a jackass he is, I didn't respond the same way. So that would be the, the main, major tip I would say is not be a jackass, which is a funny thing to me, but it is true. Uh, the other thing uh, for those who are freelancers, uh, be a freaking rock star. I mean, own it, be, a pas be passionate about what you do, research your, your, uh, your, your skill set, be the best that you can be. Uh, people are not going to call you back if you're not great, you're not good. And just some things I would say to do uh, in order to kind of be a rock star in your area of expertise. Uh, outside of being passionate and researching, over-communicate. Be transparent with your clients. Let them know when there's issues and problems coming up. They want to know that, and it builds a level of trust with them. Letting them know, hey, I messed up, or I didn't mess up. This is what's going on. I'm going to fix it. Uh, making sure you have that communication system in place. How are you going to communicate statuses on a weekly basis or a day-to-day -day basis? Uh, clients want to know that, especially if you're dealing with the owner of a company or an executive level. They don't have much time, and they want to know, you know, I use a system called red, green, and yellow. Red is the product is stopped. Yellow is, there's some issues, but we're going to be okay. Green is, everything is good. And literally, I send that every week, and they see that. So the executive, the CEO knows, I need to ask some questions, or I'm not going to be concerned about it. And it helps build a system of trust with them. 
So communicate to them. Uh, the last one of the points I would say is um, kind of along the lines of taking ownership. Uh, one of the things that makes you great as a, as a business owner or a freelancer is what made you good as an employee, right? You, a lot of us left you know, the corporate world because we were good at what we did, we felt underappreciated, and we, we launched out and did something that we knew we could do. Well, taking ownership and taking a task and owning it is so important in business. Uh, I can't tell you how many times I've handed a task off to a developer, and I'm expecting him to just run with it. And when they don't do that, it falls on me to have to manage them and then get involved. Uh, and I don't mind questions, but one of the things I learned early on was do the due diligence you need. Don't bring questions that are obvious questions that you can do a Google search on. And one of the interview questions we use when we bring guys onto our staff is, do you Google? We actually, we actually ask them, how do, you, how do you troubleshoot a problem? And if they don't, if one of the first few answers is not Google, don't worry about it. Because everything we are, the, the age that we're in now is information age. So a lot of the things already exist. You don't have to make it up or create it, okay? Uh, I'm going kind of fast. Um, I want to stop for a minute and you know, talk about um, just not being a rock star, but part of being a rock star to me is being called back. And that's one of the things we pride ourselves on. A lot of our client base is referral, referral base, and we're getting called back to the same clients doing products and products over and over again. And so that's so important to when you walk into a client, not just to gain new business, but be able to keep the business that's there. And so that's something I, I definitely stress. And we've had, um, like I said, I mentioned Fitel for you guys who are late. Our claim to fame was Fitel, and they've called us back multiple times. We've had, you know, projects left and right with them, and it's been great. Um, and so for me, I've learned that I've got to be able to maintain that and pay attention to my business in order to do that. And so my last piece of advice really is around uh, treating your business as a business. I can't say it enough because as a freelancer, we, we get pulled into the art of what we do. And if you're a person who's a designer or a photographer or like myself, an engineer, you know, especially for engineers, we can just work on tech and look at all the new tech, research and development, and we don't care about the other stuff. That's, you know, let someone else worry about that. But if you don't worry about that, you won't be able to do what you do. And that is being able to perform and being a rock star. And so spending time on your business, spending time building systems um, is extremely important. And I'm gonna give you a few examples of what I mean. Um, you know, just for here recently, we have a client who's a lawyer, she has about 30, 40 employees. And typically what I've done is I've, it was a retainer-based model, and so we set, you know, one person, one developer who's responsible for all her work. And recently, the guy's up and left. He just up and left, you know, hey, I got another, another I want to go chase a new tech, I want to do a new startup, I want to do That's great, I don't have no problem with that. And we've been documenting systems, so we've been, you know, fine with that, but I realized that every time someone decides they want to go somewhere, I didn't have a system in place that cross-pollinated the information that they needed to have. And so I had to change the system and actually take my engineers and say, okay, you're responsible for reporting for this client. You're responsible for this application. You're responsible for this application. That way, if one or two of them leave, I still have coverage and all of that. And so it's important to look at, look at your business and go back. One of the things we do, um, uh, for those who are not developers, we have a, a project management methodology called Agile. And we spend you know, two to four weeks working on a project, but then we stop and we look back and say, okay, what do we do good? What, what was the good out of this project? Was it working with others, et cetera? But then what can we improve upon? You know, what, what are we doing that we can make better? And by doing that, taking the time to look back, it makes us better. And not only ask yourselves, but ask your clients. You know, one of the other mistakes I've made early on was trying to be perfect. I thought I was, you know, my stuff didn't stink. Clients know your stuff stinks. They know you're gonna screw things up. That's gonna happen. That is gonna happen. But being transparent, taking ownership about it, that's what they appreciate, because then they, that builds a trust and honesty, okay? Um, within a business, there's so many different systems um, that I didn't have in place. I mean, I just didn't have any of them in place. And I've since then have pulled together tools and things that work for us. Of course, now with technology, there's a system out there for you, whether it's invoicing or payroll. I mean, there's so much software out here. We're building things new every day. And those, those software can help you in your business. Research and find out what your business your industry is using, you know, and there's low key, low price options. Uh, we stay very lean in our organization on purpose so that we can be uh, very competitive with some of the larger firms we have in the area. And people are shocked when we get these projects, but I'm like, I don't want a large firm. I don't need a large firm. What I want to do is I want to be the person lowest to the ground. I don't have a lot of management. I'm in myself or another senior line staff you're dealing with. Yeah, we're teaching them and consulting with them, but they're getting great value and the person who's doing the work is getting most of the rate on purpose. 
So, you know, I don't need a sales team, but I can get in and be competitive with that model and find out what works for you. And I have a lot of, you know, software packages I use or, you know, from fresh books to different software that's out there you can use and leverage. I would say research and find those systems for yourself and, uh, and implement them. Uh, one of the things I want to do is I want to open up a little bit because there's veterans in here that have a business and get some tips from you guys as well and answer any specific questions you might have around the experience that I've had uh, over the last nine years of running the business. Uh, I know some of you guys have plenty of advice and tips, like the young lady back here who talked about Chuck meeting Chuck Norris. Um, there's other things you guys can share. Uh, I'm just open the floor up to you guys and ask if you guys have any questions. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I completely agree. That's that's the one thing I learned. I've learned later on in my career. I went my website. I used to nerf myself on the website at all. No, I wouldn't even say I owned Marco at all. And it was on purpose because I felt like if I looked young, and when I go into a place, I didn't want them to prejudge that how young I look or my experience. I wanted to get in front of them and impress them with what I knew and what I could do, and show them the passion that I had for their project and to get the job done. And that's what got me going a lot of different times. And so. You know, like she mentioned, she was saying that being um, local, being there, you know, we're startups, we're innovative, we're creators. And so we're always pivoting on ideas and making things better. There's an opportunity for you to do that in your own business. And don't be afraid to look at the business model and change it some, because your clients expect you to get better. One of the things that uh, I realized over the years, if you're being a rock star, you're growing your client's business. They're getting better and stronger, and they're growing. And if you don't grow, they're going to move on. They're going to move on to the other vendor who can support their needs. So you have to be working on your business at the same time as they are, not just on their projects, not on their tasks, but saying, okay, if I, how can I scale this thing? How can I grow in certain areas? So pay attention to your business as well and your business model. Uh, any other questions or comments? Yes, ma'am. Yep. 
sure. Absolutely. And that actually had a good point that I've got. One of the things that I, I tip wise, advice wise, to grow, I was talking about keeping your client foundation and kind of growing that. But like she mentioned, uh, networking is huge uh, in order to gain new clientele. Uh, one of the things that my wife has been huge to me about, picking me about, is having a sales funnel and a strategy. How I'm going to get leads? Where is that coming from? And so, you know, part of the networking process, I always kind of had the referral base, you know, got referred to projects that always comes in, that's great. You know, it was great to walk in, and everyone says, oh, this is Fred, he's a rock star, hire him. And that's the easy sale, right? But then how do you convince that person who has no idea who you are and what you do? And so being able to have a strategy and focus on your business, it gives you that ability to work on your messaging and what you actually do. Um, and so, you know, in our space, you know, in, in a technical space, um, We've got digital agencies that work on marketing and websites. There's a whole lot of, if you're not technical in nature or, or you're not non-IT personnel, it's kind of hard to know who does what and what you really need from a technical standpoint. Uh, a lot of my clients, especially the ones that are, uh, are, are older, from the older generation, if you will, they prefer, they, conf they uh, call me a programmer. They, just in their mind, just a programmer. You know, and that's someone takes a task and just does the work. Well, in actuality, I'm an architect, I'm an engineer, someone who actually listens to your business problem and presents solutions to you and then executes on those solutions. So there's a difference, and I have to work on that messaging with my clients, let them know this is what I actually do. Otherwise, they just go find the next person who's a programmer, and they don't understand the actual value that's there. And when I'm meeting someone else new, I've got to show them the same way. I'm a, it's a value that I'm bringing to the table, not just to do your task or your bidding. My, my job is to help you grow your business. And how we're going to do that is let me evaluate your business, let me see what I can do, and let's figure out the ways we can expand here. So those, those are really important from a messaging standpoint. Go ahead. That's actually a really good point. So, <laughs> and this is actually the last year or two, I would say, that we, we created this. Um, it, it's so easy to get involved in time, time and dollars, time material building. It's easy and straightforward, but it's, it becomes, you know, you have to build trust with someone. You gotta, you gotta go through a lot of different things for someone to even trust the time you're recording. Oh, it doesn't take that long. You know, does, does it really take that long? Is it really 100 hours? You mean, can you do it for 50 hours or 20 hours? And uh, one of the things that we've done is we've changed the model a bit. We've started focusing on smaller businesses and actually offering things in the retainer package. And that retainer package is a flat amount, and here are all the things you're going to get. You know, 24-hour support, you know, one day, one week visit from someone from our staff that talks to you for eight hours, um, daily status updates, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Whatever that value you're going to create, you know, putting that in your packaging, in your marketing, your messaging. And when you're going to clientele, you're presenting them that, not with, here's my bill rate. Because they're going to ask this, no, we don't really work in that model. Our model is a flat amount, and this is what your value you're going to get for that. And so even going to your clients that you have now, again, as long as your messaging is around that, presenting them packages and showing them the benefits of that. You know, I've, I've been growing my business. Initially, I started with time and materials, but now I have these other systems in place that are going to give you more value. And by doing that, I need to change the model a bit. It's going to be a flat billing. You don't have to worry about, you know, I still give you a time card. You want the reporting, but this is the value you're going to get. So I don't even give them a block of hours. I just say, you know, for us, it's, you know, they get this hour. They can, they can kind of look at it and see what it is. But giving them that value and showing them what they're getting and what I'm putting in place. Because otherwise, you can go hire any one freelancer. What you want, what you want them to have is you're, you're offering them a system to them, right? For us, it's a service. We call, I kind of call it a software development as a service. My clients don't have developers on staff. They don't have um, someone who can manage developments. We are providing them as a service. So the whole space, we come and take over. We're managing their software, we're managing their database. You know, they just send a ticket in, and we manage the entire process. They don't know anything about building out the mobile app or the UI or the view. They get a demo every two weeks. Here's what you asked us for, here it is. You approve it, it goes to production. 
So it's a service to them because I've ran, my background was a manager of software development for many years. So I had a team of people and I looked at this, this opportunity to provide a service to people, especially small businesses. So on, on in, in continuing that point, you've got to narrow down your, also your audience and who your client is. Being a mobile developer, you can do build apps for anybody, right? But there's a, there's a narrow focus you want to start getting into. Maybe it's narrowing down on dentists or doctors or whoever that, who that marketplace is. And once you get that, that portion down, the value add is what they're needing. You know, if it's a dentist's office, they may need technology where they need a mobile app to check in patients or have patients check in or whatever the concept might be. And then focusing on that, and you put your value around just that. So it's hard sometimes as a technical person because we can do, or we have a long, strong base. But you, the more, I always say, um, technology is nothing without application nothing without application. You've got to find where you can apply and where it's going to work. That's where money starts getting made. That's where the value increases. Does that help you? Yes. So, yeah, so part of it is, uh, again, system. So one of the things that I implement with my clients is there is a help desk system. Uh, if you need, if you got a question, you, you send an email in, support at marco.co. That creates a ticket on our side. One of our staff members or contractors or vendors or whoever my back system is will answer that within four hours or eight hours or whatever your time frame is. Okay, they, so I, I create that system of communication so they know how to contact me. And some of it is kind of... Um, you give only certain information, certain people your information, right? So the CEO has my cell phone number, right? The top executives have my cell phone number. So if there's a real issue, they call me, you know. And then from this, but they their their staff, their management staff, that's you know everyday working, they're interested in tickets and getting responses to our, our regular system. But if it's a real urgent issue, there's a system for that. You know, if this is an urgent issue, send your, send your ticket in and then call our, our help desk line, and you can tell you can get through us. So it, you have to create those system of communication so that it you can scale. So I'm only one person. I can't answer and do everything. But I have people monitoring the help desk system. I have people responding back to those tickets. I have people taking the tickets and working them without me even saying anything to them, like right now. <laughs> so it's important to have that in place. Otherwise, I got to pick my phone up and because okay, it's you know, every single time. And so you don't want to have that, even if you are a leaner business or a startup, et cetera. Uh, my strategies for the nine years have been to stay lean in, in this particular model, but just because I'm not doing a startup, I'm going to scale. This is just a consulting firm that's essentially just helping smaller businesses. But there are other businesses that I have invested in, whether it's tech or time, that are startups that have gone on to do other things and have had, had to hire employees. Um, for my model, it was not that case. Any other questions or comments? Yes, sir. Yeah, so like, um, I've done like somewhat of what you're describing you do with your business. Mm -hmm. Except back in New York City, I'm doing the Dallas area. Okay. What would be like a good recommendation for like, I guess, events to go to and things to do to oh, yeah. talk to to actually like build up a new network here yeah, in Dallas? Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, First, uh, LinkedIn is uh, a huge, huge component of what I use. Uh, if you go to my LinkedIn profile, uh, you'll see kind of what uh, I've had to do over the last, I guess, six months. I basically have a really clarification of what I do, who I do, I mean, who I am, what I do, what service I offer. I mean, just real clear cut, telling people exactly what they want to know when they come to my profile. LinkedIn has uh, groups in there. Uh, there's some really, poor, really good resourceful groups. Look at, you know, and you can, LinkedIn, you can search down by regions, cities, et cetera. So you can put in Dallas and whatever your industry is, use it. I, I, I took some training with LinkedIn and the guy said this, I thought it was really good. He said, LinkedIn is like walking into a room and all the executives over here, all the people who do marketing are sitting over here, all the developers are sitting over here, all your you know, uh, service and oriented people are sitting over here. You're walking into a network already. And once you tap into that network there, it's just sitting there. I mean, it's amazing the tool that's there and I get leads all the time. And now LinkedIn actually has a lead generator. So those who have really high profiles, my profile is like a 90% something profile, they actually send me emails based upon the services people are looking for through LinkedIn. And so that, I'm not, I didn't even ask for that. I got enrolled in this beta program because of that. So that's, that LinkedIn be number one. Uh, Meetup.com, another great area to use. Um, there's you know, plenty of events happen around Dallas and around that. And what's your area of industry? What's your specific? Okay, yeah, then you're perfect. This is, <laughs> you, this, there's, you can throw a rock and even this area right here, there's meetups happen all the time. Um, find your, your tech, the area you're looking for. I would say uh, there's a few, um, 
oh, I'm trying to think of the name of the, the site. Um, I'll, I'll give my card at the very end, but there's a few sites that I have that do, do post events, and there's other developer groups that are on there. They're always posting, hey, let's meet up over here, let's meet a coffee shop, let's do a hackathon, et cetera. Um, and the other thing I would say is go to find some of these larger corporations that are um, that have some developers that you you know you admire, their profile, et cetera. A lot of times, they actually have uh, events in their, in their uh, company. They invite outside developers, too, part of their recruiting process. But, but you can go there. Uh, one of the ones I was compass over here, they have a Node.js meetup. And they, they host it for free. Just come and sign up and, and enjoy and have events every month. I think it's like every Tuesday or something like that, once a month. So pretty good. Pretty good. You're in a good area for Dallas. So technical this area is great for that. Yep, meetup.com, LinkedIn. And you just do a LinkedIn search. You'll find a bunch of people on there. And they're always meeting up about something. Yep. So I'm going to try to answer the question two ways. For first, I was not a salesperson. At least I, think I didn't think I was, right? Uh, about two, three years ago, uh, I realized I've got to start getting some kind of sales skills. And I was like, I don't want to cold call people. It just seems waste of my time. I might get the hit. I might not. So I honestly just don't do cold calling. Um, what I actually do is, is a referral. I kind of, it's a strategy that I use from, I actually use LinkedIn is quite a bit. But I find the companies that are my profile, my particular clients that, I, that I'm going after, I locate on LinkedIn their executives, uh, people that I think um, uh, could be decision makers in their company. And I send a LinkedIn message. I use LinkedIn as a, you can upgrade on LinkedIn to be a pro or whatever the options are. And I'll send a messaging, you know, as a follow up or, you know, just something that's, you know, get the attention, attention grabber and try to get them to respond back to me and then try to set up third minute coffee or a lunch. The whole point is just to get a coffee or a meeting. That's it. Um, the first time might just be, I want to find out more about your business, what you do, et cetera. If they ask about me, I'll offer it up. If not, I say, I just want to meet again, you know, maybe another month from now. And so establishing that relationship that way, um, me seeing what they do, what, they, what services I could offer to them potentially, um, just setting that seed is one portion of my strategy. The next part of once I have a meeting is then staying in touch with them. You no, know, they may not have a project for you right then or a task for you then, but a lot of times they're, oh, you know, I met this, I met Fred the other day, and you know, let me send this to him real quick and ask if he can help me with this. Um, so building and being a resource for them, you know, where it may be free, it may just be a free advice. That one hour it may just literally be, hey, have you tried this on your website? And you said you're in creative space, on a digital agency portion of it. So if you're on the website, et cetera, go to someone's websites and provide them. Here's how I can improve your profile, your website. Um, I just don't like cold calling. I think it is, I think it's, I'm not gonna say it's dead. I'm sure people, it works for some markets, some the volume of cold calling, you have the sales force to do it. But being lean, I don't wanna pay somebody, cause there's a lot of sales services that will do that for you for two, three grand a month. They'll make all these calls at these appointments. It's a lot of money to put out to me. And so I've learned to, from a strategy standpoint, use LinkedIn, set those appointments, get those email, emails going there. Um, I actually try to find second level um, network connections. In my LinkedIn profile, they, they kind of rank your connection. So it's like first, second, third, fourth. And look on LinkedIn, you can go there and see how far away am I in this person's network. And you can actually ask for a referral to this person. Hey, Fred, can you refer me to Tiffany? Um, I want to sell her website services. Oh, yeah, no problem. Hey, Tiffany, this is Fred, you know, et cetera, and this connection. Now it's not a cold call, it's a warm call. And of course, if you're a rock star and you get the direct referrals, it's a hot one. You just got to go in there and execute. So that's kind of how I, I do my strategy from my standpoint. Does it help you? Okay. Thanks. Go ahead.
Go. So there's, yeah, yes, I'm in the same way. I hate, I, well, I, you know, it's funny. We say we're not salespeople, but actually we are. We actually are salespeople. You, you know, I used to say, you know, I don't like to spend time cold calling, sending emails, doing that kind of stuff. But every time you meet someone in this room right now, there's about 40 people here, opportunity to sell right now. And it's not that you're selling them saying, hey, I'm Fred Fulcher, I want you to do your web development for you right now. Say, man, I have a project for you. But they're meeting who you are, they're understanding who your, your brand is, what you do, et cetera. It's not that you're forced onto them, but it's like um, if no one knows you are here, like we, this building didn't exist, uh, and you know, we're, we're, we don't, we're not from Dallas, like you're from New York, you don't know that 17 Pacific is here unless they have a website that says 17 Pacific.com. This is what you can do. You can rent office space here and lease space, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So some of it is around the systems you have a place around you. So do you have branding in place? Is there you know, Facebook mess ads? Are you using LinkedIn? Are you using, your, is your website updated with what you do? Is there messaging that you're doing? There's some things you can do that don't require the physical act of selling, but you're selling. And so it has to have, the, is, again, back to systems. I didn't have a system of selling, so I didn't have any business. But now people just send in emails and call, hey, Fred, I got this project over for you. But I'm not actually actually selling, but I'm networking. I'm doing LinkedIn referrals. I'm looking, you know, I have my system in place that brings in people to me versus me going to them, having to convince them who I am. But when I invite them to my LinkedIn profile, they look, oh, wow, he does all these different things here. The profile is not a bio of who I am. It's actually really an advertisement for my business. That's really what it is. And they can see all the former clients and the logos and Fortune 500 companies and Inc. 5000 companies. Oh, wow, I need to bring them in. You know what your small business is? Oh, great. So a lot of it's going before you even go out and talk to anybody. You know, what are you about? Who are you? Who do you help? Who's your, who's your market? You know, answer those questions first because that really will help you clarify those portions of it and make the selling process. For, I'm a, I'm, so I love tech, so I'll sit back and watch it from Channel 9 videos or whatever videos I want. But I don't want to go out and talk to the body about selling the product, you know, but we actually do that quite a bit and we have done that. So that's just, especially if you've been a full-time employee going to different jobs, you were selling yourself then. So you are a salesperson, you just don't know it. <laughs> yes, ma'am.
Yeah. 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 The other thing I would say, too, is I, I was just thinking when you're talking, it reminded me of a couple of things. Um, you know, one of the things I didn't do early on in my business, I didn't say it earlier, was get a mentor. You know, I was running around. I didn't have any coaching. I, you know, people have done what I've done, in a sense, but I didn't seek those people out. I didn't take them to lunch. I didn't find out who those individuals were. So whatever area you're in, when you network, find someone who's successful and either offer your services free to them, take them out to lunch. Um, there are actually uh, programs as well. I paid coaching. I have a, a, group, a, a CEO group I'm part of now that I go once. A, sorry about that. I go once a month, and I'm paying money for these people to advise it, But it's other CEOs and other industries, and I'm trying to find out what can I do better, you know. And so you, there's a lot of those things out there in this area. The other thing is information. Um, there's a gentleman named uh, Jeffrey Gittimore. I think it's called Sales Bible. Um, a great, great book. You, I would definitely get it. Definitely get it for people who don't sell. But he goes through the process of selling and how you can do that. His name is Jeffrey Gittimore, G-I-T-O-M-E-R. Um, he just sends out tips, advice, um, really good information, concrete information you can actually apply in the sales process. And so, yeah, you may not be a sales, but learning the process, learning the psychology of how someone's going to purchase from you. Um, another mistake I made, you know, when you have referrals, projects come fast and hot. And when you're trying to sell something, sell some somebody, it's a long process. Right, you know, I thought, okay, I'm gonna get out here. I'm gonna sell this. You know, I'm marketing. Like, I'm in front of somebody. We had a meeting. It was six months later, a year later, for they even started talking again about a project. I'm like, gosh. And then on top of that, it's 69 days for they pay me. So, what systems are in place for you to do that? If you get a large product and you go out there and you sell it, and they say, okay, let's start tomorrow, but I'm not gonna pay you for 90 days. So you have to, there's other things a part of that process and that sales process. You got to know what are those systems in place you need. To, to sustain that, as she has a, a, a leaner uh, entrepreneur, if you will. Yes, ma'am. Um, I have a book that I'd like to recommend. Yeah. I'm currently reading it. It's called Street Smarts. Mm, yep. An all-purpose toolkit for entrepreneurs by It's called Street Smarts. Yep, Street Smarts. The other one was Jeffrey Gittimore is his name. It's called Sales Bible. He has two books, Sales Bible, and his, I can't even think of the other name right now, but he's a really good resource. Yep. Uh, G-I-T-O-M-E-R. You'll see he's got a crazy, crazy face. He's, he's hilarious. Uh, that's it. That's, that one's great. Yep. Yeah, Little Red Book of Selling. And the sales Bible. The sales Bible, and both of them are, I have it on audio. Just on our drive, when I'm driving, I just play it. And it helps me get in that mindset of just selling the psychology of it. So, uh, again, information age, I mean, it's out here. So, if you're struggling in the area, don't struggle. Go research it, go network, ask people who are in your industry, um, other entrepreneurs. You'll be amazed at the information that is shared. Um, the other thing, you guys have seen it out here, if you're not already a part of them, co working. It's huge right now in the area, and people are there with information and advice, and you'll be amazed at the kind of connections you can make at a co-working space. So get out your office, just go one day. You now we go on Tuesdays, we get mentored, and we go spend the end of the day there on Tuesdays and just hang out and see who we meet. So that's another great resource for it. The Grove is a one. Yes, ma'am. So let me, I guess let me rephrase it. Ask them what they need and what can you, how can you help them. Tell them what you want from them. I'm, I want to be mentored. I know you're in my area of success. And it may be, uh, they might be, for example, myself, uh, I may have someone who's a large consulting firm, right? He's the CEO of the company. I may do a project for him. I may take on and do, hey, I'll do something for you for, for, for free. I'll offer my individual service for free just so I can be in your area. I'll take you to lunch, I'll take you to dinner, take you to coffee. You know, can I keep in touch with you? Um, a lot of times, you know, it's just not, it's just not them um, giving you information. You have to provide value back. You've got to be able to say to them, 
you're not going to waste your time with me. Not only am I going to listen to you and implement it, but I'm also going to bring value to you. So, you know, people are, all of us are busy. You know, we're all busy. We all would like to help somebody else, but we're busy running our businesses. And so if I can mentor somebody who's helping me at the same time on a project, great. So one of the things I actually do is a lot of full-time guys come to me who want to be contractors. I help find, I help transition them from projects. So I start them off doing part-time work with me. They'll do small tasks at nighttime, two hours, four hours, and I help graduate them through on full-time contracting. Usually on contract on my own contracts. And during that process, I'm mentoring them on help them be a better freelancer. I'm not afraid of them challenging what I do, et cetera, because my, my vision is different than what they're doing. So it helps them transition from being a full-time person to getting out and having the confidence of being a freelancer and, and getting better value for who, the, who they are. Yes, ma'am. You said assess what you already know? over our time, but anybody else have any last comments or questions? I hope it's been helpful. Uh, thank you guys again for your time and enjoy the rest of Start Week.